fact, it's more than that. I am Professor Regio Barr. I am the history professor here, as mentioned earlier, as well as the advisor for Food for Thought. Uh, we are going to be in for an excellent, excellent presentation. Um, and so at this moment in time, I'm going to have my vice president, Abby Omi Johnson, welcome our guest speaker and introduce her. Thank you so much. A native of Queens, New York, Emily Bryant is the founder and CEO of The Idea Incorporated. Her idea is to radically move people and inspire ideas in a way that her company, in a way that impacts the way we see ourselves, our institutions, and our communities. Through her company, Ebony has helped several people execute their ideas, thus helping their businesses become successful. Ebony believes that we all have work we love doing. She calls this good work. For Ebony, good work has consisted of getting her degree from the University of Central Florida in the Organizational Communications and Marketing. She has also had years of valuable work experience as she has worked with the likes of Coca-Cola, Orlando Regional Healthcare, and Labar Friedman. Ms. Bryant is also a fellow through the National Organization New Leaders Council. What Ebony loves most is being able to connect with people while causing change to happen in businesses, events, and initiatives. Due to her passion for causing change, Ebony states that the idea incorporated is more than a business development company. It is a support system and a net designed to catch you when things do, do not go as planned. It is her belief that being able to give people a way to make a living doing what they do in a systematic, successful, and enjoyable way is her life's work. Wonderful gentleman. You can't. Okay, I'll stand over here. Um, Rudy and I met at a, I think it was an event that dealt with STEM, um, technology, education, etc., for in the state of Florida. Um, and we started chatting about just work in the community. And um, I was taken by him because he was obviously very passionate. And I feel really drawn to people that are passionate. It doesn't really matter what you're passionate about, um, just that you have something that you feel called to do. So we don't usually like the word calling, um, because it sounds kind of hokey. But the way I define calling is work that you kind of be natural. Um, when you're on Facebook or Twitter, something that ignites you, makes you angry, pissed off, upset, happy, enjoyable, like whatever pulls you towards something. And that happened to me when I was um, at Central Florida, gosh, about 10 years ago now. It's been a little while. And I was at a forum similar to this, and there was a woman speaking um, in the African American Student Union. And she was talking about her work in data processing, which sounds kind of boring. But this woman was, first of all, she was African American, and African American women typically aren't in industries like data processing. But she was so passionate about her work. And I hated school. I had to, my mother's over here in the back, and my parents were really big about going to college. And so I went because you had to go. There wasn't really a choice in the matter. But I just wanted to get out of college and get to work and do great stuff with people in the community and do things that were, would matter to me. And I uh, lived in New York for a number of time. I moved back to New York after college because I couldn't wait to get out of Florida. And I lived in Queens for about a year, which is where I was born, and then Brooklyn. And I don't know if people are from familiar with Brooklyn, but there's an area called Crown Heights, which is a predominantly Hasidic Jew and West Indian population. And during that time, I was living in this small studio apartment. Probably, what is your name? So where Jessica is to Anthony, so that wide to where the store is. And that was my entire place. Closet was in the kitchen, right? Where people sat was my bed, which freaked me out. 
Um, I live, Crown Heights is also kind of a sketchy neighborhood, which I, I actually love, but you hear, every once in a while you hear gunshots, which scares shit out of my stuff, out of my mother. I mean, it was just really amazing to be, I loved it, I loved every bit of it. And I lived there for about three years, and then I got laid off. And at that time, I was working for a business-to-business, -business, I mean, it was a B2B company called AIM. And I was laid off, I was working on Wall Street, I was doing marketing and business development for this organization. And I got laid off, I walked downstairs, I was in Starbucks off of Wall Street and Broad and I was hysterical. Like I'm living in New York, I don't have any money, I can't move back home, I can't afford my place, what am I gonna do for a living? Like how am I going to make my life work? Um, and I thought, gosh, I'm gonna have to figure out something. So I got on unemployment, and unemployment doesn't really pay you anything, right? I think I was probably making like maybe $600 a month from unemployment, and my rent was $700 a month, so that didn't include anything else. I mean, it was awful. And at the time, I also owned my, what would then have been my second business, Bells and Wolves. And what we did is we did business development for fashion designers coming out of Parsons and IT. And I felt particularly called to this because I think artists and designers are particularly amazing people because they're usually kind of weird which I love and they're very artistic they're, they're very drawn to what they love to do but they have no idea how to run a business they don't know what it means to create a business plan they don't know how to do finances they don't know what good credit looks like and if they don't have it how to get it up and you use typically if you're trying to get money from investors if you want to buy a home you have to have good credit. So that all this, the, this is the kinds of things we were doing with Bells and Bulls. So anyway, I'm living in Brooklyn, had this company, and about two years passed, I was making my life work. I, I mean, and I did everything. I don't want this to sound like it was glamorous. I was painting fences in Bed-Stuy, New York, right? I was doing everything I could not to move home, to continue to have a business, and to do work that I loved which at that point I wasn't really sure what that exactly, I couldn't articulate it to you then. So I, I was probably a little bit older than some of you are now, and I could not get myself to figure out, well, if this is what I want to do, work with fashion designers and help them run their business, um, is that going to work for me in the long run? Is that going to be effective? Are people going to have successful businesses because of what I did? Um, and do I really care that much about fashion designers in general? which was hard to say because at that point I'm kind of inundated in the market. I was going to um, Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week every twice a year. I was being invited to these fashion shows to get for us to take fashion designers on. And I realized after about two years that this was no longer something that I was passionate about. Um, and I wasn't making, I still wasn't making a lot of money. So I wasn't passionate, it was my business. And when you talk about being having a business owner, it sounds really glamorous, right? Like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business, that's real cool. But that's not really cool if you're not making any money. Like, that's not particularly fun at all. So there was, I had to have a come to Jesus moment with myself. Like, okay, so what now? So am I gonna go home? Um, home for me would have been Florida. My parents moved to here to South Florida. I was, um, they lived in Jacksonville, Florida at the time. And I had been, trying it day in and day out for two years at that point. And at the, I decided to sell my portion of the business, because I had a business partner, Joe Morris. She is from London and was still really passionate about our business, but I wasn't. So I sold it to her and then started what is now the idea. Um, and I just want to stop for a second to talk a little bit about passion. Like you hear this word bantered about a lot. Purpose, you should find meaning. You know, all that sounds really good in theory. But immediately you're thinking about, well, I don't know that I have a passion, I don't know that I have a purpose, and I don't know that it's going to pay me what I need to be paid in order to live the life I want to live. So you have to stop, and I had to stop, and think about, well, what is that going to look like? Um, so what I recommend to people typically when they're starting a business or thinking about an idea, a new idea, is to consider what is it, as I said earlier, what is it that you're drawn to? And I don't necessarily mean just an industry, although that could be it. How do you want to help people? Most people want to help people when I ask them that question. But how do you do that? Are you the kind of person that's very analytical? Are you very creative? Do you see the big picture or are you more detail-oriented? 
Are you into music? Do you like technology, the combination thereof? Are you interested in fixing things? Like one of our clients um, back in the day was really big into computers. He would fix computers. And he would just do it for friends for no cost, but spend hours doing it. And he said, well, I'll just do it because I'd like to do it. But why couldn't what you like to do, but what you do for a living, be what you do for a living? And so I realized that I like to take people's idea and make them into a business. But not just make them into a business, make them into a business that supports your goals and the goals of the people around you. And that's essentially what social entrepreneurship is in a nutshell. It takes your ideas and it helps to impact a specific community. And I'll give you a few examples of our clients right now, but that um, is a relatively new phrase, social entrepreneurship. And at the time I was living in New York, I didn't really know that that was what I was being drawn to do. I just needed to make a living. And cut to May 2010, I moved back to Florida. Um, my parents were divorcing, my grandparents lived here. You know, family stuff started to happen. And family is very important to me. And because I was doing my business, I could do it anywhere. And so I decided to move to be closer to them. Um, my father moved to Jersey. My mom was down here. My brother also in Central Florida. He was graduating. And I thought, well, it's probably time for me to figure something else out. New York was, got old. I love New York. I go back there all the time. Um, but it's, it's a different way of life than Florida, to say the least. Um, for example, it's 20 degrees there right now. My best friend is a police officer for the New York Police Department, and she shoveled snow for an hour and a half the other day, right? Like, that's not a way of life that I wanted to live anymore. So April of that year, I moved to South Florida, and I had the ID Inc. And so we started working with businesses that wanted to make an impact in the community and wanted to do it in a way that served them financially, socially, environmentally. And so what we do is think about social entrepreneurship from the perspective of how you benefit others and how they will pay you to do so. And so the example I'll give is one of our clients has a, her family has dealt with addiction. One of the highest rates of addiction in this country um, is here in Broward County. Um, it's also part of the reason, there's a lot of statistics and variables to this, but it's part of the reason why we also have a very high homelessness rate. And so she went about a mission to take what she has learned from years of being in recovery and help families of addicts. But she didn't know how to run her business. She didn't know how to set up an email. She didn't have any kind of email forums. She didn't know how to set up a shopping cart, banking, any of those things. She didn't know what it meant to prepare a business plan for investors, and she could not run all of those back-end um, pieces by herself. And so what we do is help her run her business. Um, so, so let's say, for example, you're a tech person. There is a program called Infusionsoft, and what it does is it takes your, all of your contacts, your email marketing, and it helps you to organize that so people are buying your products. And in this case, this <coughs> client wanted to create programs where she could send out emails and in exchange, people would join phone calls, webinars, in-person workshops. She would do speaking engagements in exchange for money. And people don't really like to talk about that because when they think about doing good work, they don't think that it should come with a price. They have kind of a, there's a negative connotation that goes along with that. But the truth is, is that, or at least for me, I believe that if you want to do good work, you can make a living doing it. But a lot of social entrepreneurs, part of the, the ugly side of social entrepreneurs and the part that this client dealt with, is she didn't feel comfortable earning a living doing it. It was a constant battle for years of working with her, trying to get her to see her value. So she would give away stuff for free, similar to the tech guy that fixed computers a couple years back. And so part of the, the, the work that we have to do as a team, so it's me, when I first started it was obviously just me, and over the years of working hard, knocking on doors, asking hard questions, being on social media, sending out emails, making mo more calls, getting more no's than I got yeses. I mean, it was, it, there is no way, shape, or form I will ever give off that this is a glamorous 
existence. I love every minute of it, and it is a lot of work. But it is good work, it's fun work. And in the case of this client, we encouraged her and got her to see that you can, some families will pay for these programs with their kid or their sister or their mother who is dealing with addiction, drugs, sex, gambling, etc. We can show them how to deal with their uh, loved one's addiction and you can make an, a living doing it. You can build a successful business while doing so. And that's really uh, one perfect example of how the IP works. You show up to our doors, we talk about what your needs are, we decide whether we can be of service to you as much as you can be of service to us, that's a mutual conversation. And then you decide from there, well, is this the time for a business like yours? And so I wanna stop there just to present that based on where some of you obviously are in college. Um, I think sometimes there's this need to you know, have all the answers, right? I need to know what I'm gonna do, how I'm gonna make a living, who I'm gonna marry, if you wanna marry, if I wanna have children, you wanna know all of that right now. And if it doesn't look like that, if it doesn't have that pretty package to it, you don't wanna do it, you don't want any part of it. But that's not reality, and you end up causing a, a detriment to your career by putting that kind of pressure on yourself. So the suggestion I always give to clients is, how can you, as a business owner, Think about just the very next step, not 10 steps ahead. So it's, for example, is that writing a business plan? Do you have the money to hire someone like my company? Maybe, maybe not. But there are tons of organization just here in South Florida that can help you make that first step. So I always suggest two things. One, write a business plan, and to do that, go to score.org. It's a great organization, it's free of charge, and they'll help you write a business plan. They'll also give you what I think is a, a, the second and most important point, is feedback on whether your idea is viable. Now, most people said my idea wasn't viable first. My grandmother, who I love, she was in Raleigh, old southern black woman. She said, well, when are you gonna get a real job? You need health insurance, like you can't, you can't do this, this is ridiculous. Where are your 401k, you gotta save money, this is stupid. My, this is my grandmother, right? Get it. This, the scariness of having your grandmother tell you, not just one time, I mean, this is, you know, she got off the phone once and she said, I'm going to pray for you, Ebony, you need to get a job. Oh, God, that sucks. I mean, can you imagine this somebody you love, like you respect? Everybody's not going to see your idea as viable. I would venture to see, and it, there was a period of time that the only person that saw my that idea as viable is my mother and father. Friends, everybody was like, eh, you're going to have to figure this thing out. You can't be painting fences in, in bed style for the rest of your life. But, and so I say that to say, you should run your idea by people. People who know what they're talking about. Score mentors, professors. You have a lot of resources around you. Throw your idea out there and see what you get back. But you also, if there is a part of you that knows that your idea is real, then you can't let anybody stop you from knowing that truth. Because there will be a lot of people that will say, you're losing your mind. You're not going to make any money. But you have to do your very best next step. Business planning, pilot programs always work. Let's say you want to, you're a mechanic. I think that is one of the most underserved, thankless jobs there is. If your car broke down and there were no mechanics, well, where would we be? We'd be up shit's curve. That's what we would be. Right? And so what you need to think about is what idea do you have, like a mechanic, for example, that could benefit a group of people? Not everyone is gonna get it. Think about if you're a mechanic in this case, working on someone's car or going to dumps and working on pieces. Like think about what you can do to to hone your passion, your skill, your purpose. <laughs> Write a business plan, start thinking it out. But don't just hold on to that business plan, that document that's gonna be on your Word or your computer, right? You need to start thinking about passing it out to people that you trust that will give you honest feedback. Now, what I, what, um, I was told to talk about in part today is how to take your idea specifically as it would impact a community and make it real. And so another um, thought that I had was 
some of the boards I sit on. So I sit on a lot of boards, one of which is the Broward County Cultural Council. And what they do is, in part, they help Broward County to remember and be encouraged by the arts. And so we sign on the dotted line for organizations that need money um, to start their nonprofit or their initiative or their event. And I use that as an example because one way for you to start your idea and move it forward is to think about the resources that are around you, like commission boards, like advisory councils that are specific to whatever you're interested in. There is an advisory council or board in every sector you can possibly imagine in this city alone. Substance abuse, technology, education, the arts. More specifically than the arts, they have a, there's a, a um, non-profit like uh, alternative art organization down in Miami and one of their specialties is graffiti. That's like awesome to me. Right, I mean that kind of thing is you want to start researching where you can start to put, get your foot in the door and talk about your idea more. So more people can know about what you do and how you do it. I think it's really important for you to start talking about what matters to you. Also talk about it with your friends. Talk about it with people who have, or in your industry which brings me to my next point, which is a mentor. People say that a lot. I'm sure a lot, all of you have heard that at least one or two times in your college career. But I cannot tell you how beneficial it is enough to get someone who is older than you, who is willing to take the time on a regular basis to go to bat for you when you need it. I don't mean just throwing your resume out there. I'm talking about giving you feedback about ideas, suggesting that you meet other people, taking you to networking events. All of those kinds of um, events and activities are so important to your idea working. Before you even come to someone like me, you need to be able to bring on a mentor, talk to your friends and family, talk to your, um, the, your peers here at Broward College about your idea and how it could benefit a community. So I want to stop there and see if anyone is open or have courage enough to ask a question about a specific idea you have or idea you've heard and how to make it work, which is what we do. Anyone? Yeah, my friend, he, um, he wants to turn wireless routers into income producing assets. So what he wants to do is he created what's called a bouncer ad. And so if you have a, a wireless network at a barber shop, you're sitting there on your phone, you sign on to the Wi-Fi, you see the ad that someone pays, you know, and then he makes money for the advertiser and then he pays the barbershop for letting him use their uh, router. What do you think of that idea? Well, I'm going to give you, that's good, and let me tell you why sometimes those ideas don't work. The same business model is used with ATMs. So if you ever go into a random store and they have a random ATM there and they charge like $5 to take $20 out, hmm. that same concept is what you're talking about. So the portion of that, the, that money goes to the store and a portion of it goes to you. Now, it does work, but it's more of a quantity issue. You start making money when a lot of, a lot of barbershops, for example, are doing it. So it works, but it requires you, it's more of a quantity issue than quality. But it, 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 I think it's a really good advertising plan because if you put an ad on a bench, who the hell knows how many people see that ad or even pay attention to it or not. But with his business model, you have to sign in using your Facebook, your Gmail, your Twitter, or something like that. And then that data is recorded, and it also, when you sign on to the Wi-Fi, it refers you to the advertiser's website. So not only is he recording who's seeing the ad, but he's also sending you to their website, and you watch the ad. So it's like a three-prong thing, and it, it actually you actually get some value out of your advertisement, in right. my opinion. Right. Well, I think one thing that we, we did for a client of mine is something similar with an app, where people were picking and choosing what apps they saw based on whatever they clicked on on the client's website, right? And so we were able to pull all of that data and store all of the information based on what their interests seemed to be because they clicked on certain things, right? And that's what I would uh, encourage your friend and you to think about is, yes, you should be keeping the data, but also think about what are people's interests are 
interests and therefore where should your time and energy and money be going? And by that I mean if they're click if they're not clicking at all on vacuums, but everybody's clicking on watches, then the next step I would take as a business owner is getting sponsorship from those watch companies. In increasing their avatar their advertising rates. You see what I'm saying? You want to think about not just pulling data, although important, that's a quantity issue. You also want to think about how do you get in front of that business model, and by that I mean working directly with the people that that are advertising for you. Increasing their advertising rates, encouraging them to work with other different data models that you have. You want to think about always being a front of your in front of the people that you're working with and figuring out how to get more dollars out of them when it's necessary to do so. Questions? No, I'll pass that advice along. Okay. Others? I think uh, as an advisor and also a lot of student organizations or members of student organizations are, are, are here, one thing that I think is a struggle for all of our clubs is getting other members of the campus passionate about what we're passionate about. Some of it I think may be an issue of branding as far as, yes we do this specific thing, but how do we relate that message as far as getting people on board to be a part of that specific thing. So for example, Dr. Bernstein is an advisor for the psychology club. Some people may see the psychology club as a club that's dedicated to the field of psychology, but there's a lot of other things that they happen to do. So therefore, you don't have to be a psychology major to be a part of the psychology club. Same thing could be said about all of our other clubs. What advice would you give to us as advisors, and more importantly, to our club members, on getting other members of this campus to be passionate about what they're passionate about, especially if it comes down to a club trying to create some change, some social change on campus. How do we do a better job of that? So two things. One, I think, um, and this is not an answer that you as an advisor want to hear, but I think a lot of times we as community activists or people that just want to make change in the world in some way, we're always trying to get everybody on board with our mission. Right? Everybody is not going to be passionate about the environment. Right? Like, I don't want anything to happen to the Everglades, but I'm not thinking about it on a regular basis. Right? And so you really have to, in my opinion, narrow your market. The um, tendency of business owners is to throw the net very wide and hope that you catch something, as opposed to narrowing down where where you're thinking about what in the psychology department, to use that example, is of interest to people in terms of current events. <clears throat> so I hate to use this example, but everyone knows about Bobby Christina, right? And if you don't, Whitney Houston's daughter was found um, face down in the tub <coughs> over the weekend. So there's a lot that can go into that from the psychology department. Her relationship with her mom, um, drug addiction, assuming she's on drugs, I don't know that, her relationship with her family, etc. So you have, the reason I'm bringing that up is you have to apply it to something real. You have to meet people where they are. So using this gentleman's example here, if you're in a barbershop, then you're, you sh most of the time, you're not focusing on women. And if, if, if you are, you're focusing on women from the perspective of their dude. You see what I'm saying? You have to meet people where they are if you want them to buy what you have. So as advisors and the people a part of the clubs, you have to think about one, who are the people that would be most interested in this? That's the first thing, that's what I would think about. But also, what are current events going on where people would actually be interested in what I'm talking about? So if you're the advisor of the psychology department and you want to have a discussion about psychology, don't say a psychology department on Thursday at 9. Talk about, well, what are your thoughts about what happened with Bobby Christina? You know what I'm saying? Like that, You have to tie it into something that's real for people, not what you think is interesting. Because you're an adult, right? You're, you're, you're not relating to people if you don't meet them where they are. In this case, well, these are college students, so you want to think about it from that perspective. Any follow-up questions? Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm a history teacher here, and this is my class that just came in. And when I walked in, you were talking about leadership styles. And I think it was just two classes ago, Aliyah, if I'm correct. We were talking about leadership, and we were talking about how resistant so many of our students, and I'm sure Professor Jean Bart will agree with me, are to take leadership positions. So we talked about, and I named them, we have a triage person, we have a thinker, we have the person who knows how to prioritize. Can you expound for them? Because 
they hear it from a professor and it goes in one ear and bounces right back out. Okay, but can you expound for them what we mean by leadership style and the fact that you can be the quiet leader, the fact that you can be the force behind the one who's speaking, because not for nothing, but that Latin American history class that's sitting here right now is so full of potential, and yet they're scared to bring it out. Yep. How do you, how, how would you help them with that? Well, I, I'll speak to them, but I'll also speak to you as the professor and say, <coughs> I don't know if you remember being 20 something years old, but, right? So, but being, you know, when I, when I was 20 something, I, well, I've always been kind of outspoken, but a lot of people don't come into their own, right, until they have had enough experience to be able to do so. Um, and I think sometimes our elders, people that are older than us, wiser than us, want to force us to do something before we're actually prepared to do it. Um, and at the same time, stop doing so, I've seen a lot of mentors do this, if they don't follow all of our instructions. As opposed to know that some of the stuff that you're talking to them about is seeping in. And in their time, I would assume that this is the case for a lot of you, will eventually come out of your shell and, and uh, step into the leadership position that you're meant to be in. But I will talk to the students about how important it is to um, honor who you are as a leader. And I'll speak to this in, in particular with a client who is self-admittedly an introvert and had felt uncomfortable with sitting on an advisory board in DC where she lives and where her offices are. And the problem with not stepping into a leadership position is you don't have a lot of room, one, to complain, but you have even less room to change anything that's not working for you. So you have to think about, well, what is it that your skills, you being quiet, you being loud, you being abrasive, how can that benefit and impact a community? How can you take your passion and just speak up a little bit? Now, part of the reason people don't like to be leaders is because they don't want to be judged, right? They don't want someone else to look down on them. They don't want to be wrong. They don't want to look like an idiot. Um, but when you are talking about something that you know a little bit about, let's say it's your culture, right? Let's say you're from St. Croix and you know a lot about the history and there's an opportunity for you to sit on a board or be a part of a club that is talking about Caribbean history, for example. You know about that. Why not speak to that, that, uh, that work and your history, your family background, etc.? And specific to leadership styles, um, there, there are a lot of uh, tests that you can take to define what that is, uh, Myers-Briggs being one of them, for example. But what I would do if I were you is there's a book called Strength Finder, and it is an excellent book that talks to students about and people about what it would look like for you to hone in on your strengths and while simultaneously knowing your weaknesses. We all have them, and pretending like you don't actually prevents you from stepping into your leadership position. So I always recommend that you identify what your strengths are and then find opportunities to be a part of communities, groups, initiatives, boards, etc., where you can actually hone in on more about who you are and how your benefits can how your strengths can benefit whatever group you're a part of. Follow up? Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there, one question I'd like to ask pertains to age. Um, at this current moment, I know someone who's 15 years old, and he's brilliant. He, funny enough, actually is pursuing mechanics. Uh, but because of his age being 15 years old, he doesn't really have the legal opportunity to work with some of the tools and what have you. But that's just a, a smaller case. The larger case is, do you think that age is a hindrance to uh, chasing or do you have a dream or something of that nature, an idea that you want to pursue? And if not, how can you overcome it? It depends on the person, really. Um, I started the concept of owning a business the first time when I was seven. Um, I ripped out magazine pictures on ebony and then glued it on construction paper decorated it, and then sold it on the block in New York. Who bought it? Um, I've always felt like I should be doing my own thing. 
I've always felt I, I, I did, could not do corporate America. It drove me absolutely insane. I hated cubicles. I didn't want somebody to tell me when to show up and when to leave. I can do work, I can do it fast, and I didn't need someone to put me in a box. And so what I, the reason I share that particular story is that it depends on the person and their drive. And there's nothing wrong with you if you, don't, if you have a dream and you don't pursue it for years. That happens often. But ultimately, the key to my success has been perseverance. There, there isn't anything around it. So it doesn't matter what your age is, you'll find a way. In his case, he has parents, I'm assuming, grandparents, aunts, uncles, people like you who can share with him, is there a mechanic that on the weekends or after hours can show him a few things, take him under his wing. There's a lot of ways around age. Age is, is I mean, I hate to be corny, but it's nothing but a number. I mean, there are ways around any obstacle that you can face. And as lame as that seems, it's important for people to recognize that. Ultimately, my work and what I've done in my career has been because I kept knocking on doors. No one, nothing, including my own self-doubt, my own limitations were gonna stop me from doing what I wanted to do. No one. And so if you are committed to something, you're committed to it. My grandmother in Raleigh, right? The, the bills that need to be paid, my own sense of passion, my drive, nothing was going to stop me. And so if you feel like there is some place, homelessness in this, in this city, in this country, addiction, um, women's rights, the LGBTQ inequalities, those kinds of things, if you're passionate enough about it, you'll find a way. Yes, sir? Good morning. My name is Lamar, and my question is, for those of us that are passionate about something, but we hit so many stumbling blocks, we continuously fail at trying to achieve our ultimate goal with this passion, what are some tips that we can use to re-strengthen us and to keep us motivated to continue pursuing our passions? That's a good question. Um, I'm going to be real with you for a moment with that, because I think that that's a hard question for people to answer honestly, and I can't do that for you or anybody else. What I do when I come up against my own roadblocks, and there have been many, I have to constantly ask myself, is this truly what I feel called to do? To me, that for me, that question overrides any self-doubt I have. I may feel self-doubt, and I tell you I do that often. I have a partnership with FIU, I'm working with SunServe, an LGBTQ organization, and I'm constantly thinking, I don't know how the hell I'm going to pull this off. With all the clients and all the commitments that I've made to myself, you ask yourself, so this is the first tip I would give, is this really what I'm called to do? And the second thing is more practical stuff. So for example, when there was a stumbling block, where, what is the learning in? Right? Where, what lessons did you glean from that experience? I think that people really see failure as like, well, this is something I can't do. But to me, and I can give you a ton of examples, failure has been what drove me farther. Because what it meant to me was, oh, well, I failed at this, but I did it, and nothing horrific happened to me. Right? And, and I, so I was driven by it because I knew that there was something that I was meant to do, so I kept at it. But I looked at what the failure was and what could I have done differently. Um, sometimes, like my previous company, Bells and Bulls with the Fashion, um, it was time to hang up my shears, right? Like, it was, I needed to go. And that, that's a hard, I mean, it took me months to own up to that and say, okay, it's time for me to move on. So sometimes it is time to move on, but even that experience catapulted me into something else to say, well, these are the learnings that I had from it, and now I can take this and build another business. So ask yourself that question. Um, see where your failures are and take them as lessons. And the last thing that I think is really important, and this goes back to the mentor thing, ask people in the industry or the sector that you're interested in, tell them exactly what happened and what they would have done differently. That does two things. One, it tells those people, not just one if you can, multiple people, it tells those people that you're really interested in doing it. I just told Rudy one day, hey, I want, I, I want to make an impact on college students. I haven't tapped into that market. I like the idea of showing people passion that are in, in that age range. So we built a relationship. 
a friendship based on that based on that knowledge. You see what I'm saying? Yes. But people don't know that unless you communicate what you've done, what didn't work, what you'd like to do. They don't know what your idea is if you don't tell them. I know that sounds simple, but back to this professor's point, if you're hiding behind or hiding on the wall, nobody's going to know what your interests are. Nobody's going to see you as a leader if you don't lead. You, you see what I'm saying? You have to be real about what your skills are in order for people to be able to support and help you. And in the case of me, build a financially successful business. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Anyone else before we wrap? Excuse me. Yes. Um, I was asking about the financial part of starting up a business. How much do, would you say for an estimate? Would it range on what it was exactly that you're interested in starting? Or would it be, oh, this is the set amount that you're going to need, like the budget expenses of starting up? Like, is there a safer way to avoid pulling out a loan in order to start your business? Good. So you asked a couple of questions, so I'll yeah. a couple of it. The first, well, yes, it does depend on the business, obviously. Um, my business, for example, has very, very little overhead costs because I'm a service-based business. So, I, for example, I don't make any products, so I don't have to pay for those products. Um, over the years, I've had more overhead because I have a team, so I have to pay that team. I have online programs, I have to, you know, things like that. The best way forward when you are planning your business financially is to research what's already been done. There is nothing new under the sun. Right? Like, I know that it's shocking to people, but you're not that special. So, use other people's businesses and examples and what they did and what expenses they've incurred. Google is your friend, right? Libraries, even though a lot of people don't use them anymore, they have a lot of resources to tell you. Let's say you're interested in doing hair or you're interested in starting a consulting business. There's a lot of information about what kind of costs you need. For example, do you have to take any, um, any uh, continuing education classes? Do you need CEUs, right? Do you need, uh, or will you need an office space? There is information out there. Once you decide what your idea is, figure out what industries are within that idea, what people have already done what you've done, see if you can talk to any of those people. Most people are more than willing to talk to you about what their expenses have been, what their, where, where, where their failures have been, and where, how they can, how you can do better based on what they've done. And also using Google. That's the first thing you should do is think about your idea, the industries, talk to lots of people. Poke around, be interesting, be curious. You see what I'm saying? People are not, they don't ask enough questions in order to get the information they need in order to make their business work. No, but what I was asking was the, the expense rate. Like, how do, you, how do you exactly calculate that? But you were saying something about, it's a, you have a service-based business, so the, the amount that you spend is lesser than someone that would be selling a product Correct. or something. So you're saying that I would have to calculate the manufacturing, the the selling, the branching out. I would have to pay for that rather than doing the service business. In the service business, you just have to pay your employees. In, in the case and, of me now, yes. Right. And what's the other coverages that you would have to consider? So generally, the overhead that you're thinking about is marketing and advertising. Bookkeeping, accounting, any sort of kind of administrative materials like online programs, sending out emails, things like that. If you are working with somebody and for someone you have to, uh, or uh, someone under you, you have to pay them. So employees. Uh, most businesses, when they first start out, don't pay themselves, but that again depends on the industry. So we'd have to talk offline about that, but. Paying yourself is, is another expense. Is there is there a possibility of insurance coverage for sometimes? Some, it depends again on the on the one of our clients just started getting insurance within the last year and she's been in business for five. To cover the business. Correct. So and themselves. File, so you don't have to file for the bank for Exactly. But again, depending on the industry, you want to and that's the reason I'm suggesting you speak to a mentor about your specific focus is because there's a lot of variables and overhead costs that I wouldn't know because I don't know what the industry is. Right. And it really does vary from industry to industry. I have a question. Um, what, if, what advice would you give to someone who's trying to figure out how they can start a business? Because my problem is, is that when I get a little upset when people say they're going to school to study business because in my opinion they teach you what to do when you already have a business. 
They don't teach you how to make a business. You know what I mean? And I think that's the more important part. Is you can teach yourself accounting and all that stuff as hard as you go. But how do you really make a business? How do you sit down and say, figure out, this is what I'm going to do? Well, I think the question you're asking is how to make money doing it. Is that correct? Not, not just the how can I make a business that's not already on every corner. Okay. So, two things. One, that's where market research comes in. Now, that's kind of a coin term that people banter about a lot. But what I mean by that is you have to do your research. So, for example, if you know, also listening to people, but let me just say this. If you know that within a 10-mile radius, there isn't a convenience store, and you know, so therefore there's a need there, then you've already started the process of finding out whether this is something, a viable business for you or not. Another thing you can do is look at the local city census. What businesses are most popular? Of those businesses, what, which ones are still in business or not? Um, that information is, is, you can find it anywhere. And so what I would suggest is that you think about whatever business you have and then look at within where you want to do it, or is, is it overpopulated? If it's still an area for you to be able to infiltrate, is it a, will it be a viable business for you? Do you have the time, energy, and money to do so? Are you being supported by family or friends? Have you done this business with anyone else, if the idea with anyone else? Have you piloted yet? For example, have other friends paid you to do it? Those kinds of things you should do before you even think about opening it up. You want to do your market research first, and again, that goes back to talking to people who have already done it before you, and see what they've done, what their financials have been, what their pitfalls were. You really want to start talking about the business to people who have done it in order for it to work. Um, I agree with you that majoring in business was always, I, it was weird for me too, because they weren't teaching me what I needed to know in order for me to structure it. How do I know when to hire, when to fire? Should I build a website or no? What kind of business card should I have? People don't usually know that. So how you know that is by learning, how I learned that, is by learning from other people who have done it before me. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, my other question was the gathering of the funds without having to pull out a loan. Like, are there safer ways to do that? Um, like, if you're saving money, like, let's say you, you, you're going to college, and you want to purchase a CD that you can open in five years, would that be a safe way to do it? Like to have the funds to start up, but then how do you protect your business idea from being stolen or already done? Like so, so the, to gather the funds without pulling out a loan. There, one specific way that's relatively new in the last five to ten years, which is something called crowdfunding. Um, Indiegogo, GoFundMe, Kickstarter. Those are three examples of where you pitch an idea to people who are showing up to this particular website and then they decide to fund a particular idea or concept. And I'll give an example to that. Um, most people have heard of Humans of New York. A guy has a photographer, he took a bunch of pictures, blah, blah, blah. In that, there was this kid last night, y'all gotta know, I was in tears on Facebook. This kid said that his hero was the principal in Brownsville, New York, which is a very tough area of Brooklyn. And he said he was a hero. Humans in New York took the picture. Now, a week and a half later, they raised over a million dollars to send the entire class every year for the next 10 years, I think, to Harvard. And they're deciding where else to use that money. That is a perfect example of how you use your passion and over time, it benefits other people. And so I use that example for you because crowdfunding is a way to raise money for your idea. Now there's sometimes there's no way around getting a, getting a business loan. That's the, where credit comes in. Um, there's a lot of, so at your age, if you have not gotten credit cards yet, I highly recommend you don't. If you do, go with a credit union and specifically go with a secured credit card. Meaning, you have to put X amount of money down, they typically match you, and then you have that am amount of money secured. That's a way to build credit so that in that five to seven year period of time, you can go back and get a loan, assuming you wanted to go that route. Um, and there's also kind of the old school way, which is save money. There's not some easy way to do it. Those are the three core ways that I've seen done or have done for our clients. Thank you. Yes, sir, you're welcome.
you answered most of my question with uh, your previous answer about networking um, and everything that you covered. But how would you go about helping someone set up a nonprofit organization as opposed to a business? Okay, good question. So there's two. Um, I can't see you. I'm blind to that. There's two ways for people to do social entrepreneurship these days. There's nonprofits, so 501c3 or c4, and there's also something called B Corp. I have to, the last time I checked, B corporations were not yet in law in Florida, but I have to find out. Um, but what that means is it's a combination of both the benefits of nonprofit and for-profit work. Uh, bcorp.org, I believe, is the website. When we'll Google it, you'll see it. And what that does is it helps you get tax write-offs the way nonprofits do, but you also, it's, there's a lot of rules to it, so I'm not I'm skirting over a lot of the important points that you should know. Um, that is also a process, same way with C3 and C4s. Um, usually, it takes about a year in this state for the state to approve you as a nonprofit. Nonprofits are, it's more work than most people recognize. You have to have an executive director, you establish a board. Keeping boards together and engaged is sometimes very difficult, um, but possible. Um, so I would, my first step when I'm thinking about a nonprofit is get all the paperwork offline. Uh, Sunny.org, I believe, is where you get that information. And then start to talk to professors in your financial department. Because the first thing, in the, the usually the key is the mission and vision, but also the financials. Line by line, where is the money coming from, who is it going to, who are you donate. You have to be able to account for that in very um, specific and detailed ways that people don't always recognize when they're getting into it. So one, SCORE, um, SCORE is also another great resource in terms of nonprofits. But B Corp, C3, C4, takes about a year. Financials is the first step I would take and establish a really strong board. Typically family and friends is a good start. Last questions before I head out? Yes. Yes, um, my name is Yoni and I don't necessarily have a passion. I know I'm pretty good at things, like most things, but I don't really know what I want to do with my life yet. Like in my head, like I want to be a lawyer because my parents are are lawyers and I'm really good at arguing with people and making a case and everything. But I don't really think I have a passion for it. So in your opinion, what do you think like how do you know when you find your passion? That's a good question. Um I, I'm silent because I think um, I have a friend of mine who thought law was her passion, and I have a lot of friends that did this. But once they got into the legal field, realized that it wasn't what it was cracked up to be. Um, so what I would suggest, specific to your example, is see if you know anyone that you can talk to about their experience in law. Maybe visit a courtroom while they're doing a case, things like that. Um, we currently have an ambassadorship program with the ID Inc., and four of our ambassadors are thinking about being lawyers and whether it's their passion or not. And part of our goal is to help them to decide that. The reason I bring that up is that you don't know until it kind of dawns on you. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? So you want to kind of dabble in a lot of things. My belief, and everyone doesn't agree with this, is that on some level you do know. There's something that you feel drawn to. Writing, drawing, dancing, something that kind of moves you. And that's not necessarily going to be called a passion, because that word is loaded, it doesn't really mean anything in, in this day and age. But you want to see what, what do you feel drawn towards in your life? Do you feel drawn to helping people? You said arguing. There's a lot of things you can do. You know what I'm saying? That, to me, you know, you can be an advisor, you can be an activist, you can be a, uh, in the, the penal system, they have people, the names escaping me, where they advocate, advocate for children. So their entire life is making sure that the children is being protected. You know, there's a lot that you can do with what you're naturally good at. So keep poking around at it, and then at some point, I guarantee you, this I can promise, it will dawn on you. Something will say, you know what, this is it. But don't feel a level of, I always felt all this pressure when I was your age to know exactly what I was gonna do. You'll figure it out, but keep dabbling in different things, poke around, go to these clubs, and see, well, what is it that I feel like I could benefit, what industry, what sector, where would I be of service to people the most? Does that answer your question? Thank you so much, guys. It was great.
I think the second speaker was um, a very crucial asset that we're needing right now in society as far as where we're shifting towards, um, being that we should all be somewhat our own social entrepreneur, which is a concept that she brought up. Basically, social entrepreneurship is where you yourself figure out where you can service others, and that way, that in, in whole benefits everyone, and how also you can somewhat comp be compensated for it. And that's something that's very crucial right now. Every, everything right now is all very uh, in a selfish manner, and I think we should think more about uh, spreading the wealth that the earth provides and that we are able to provide for the people. She's so energetic and she captivated everyone. Everyone had something to say, everyone asked questions. Um, she was very informed and she was not selfish with the knowledge that she had. That was awesome. And I noticed her body structure, she was confident. So I know that if I aspire to do something, I have to be confident also. I have to be unspoken just like that. And I can't be afraid of someone to tell me no. I have to knock that no to the side and keep pushing for a yes. And I, I, I admired that about her. And I also like how she was able to, to give us information and tell us where to go to find that information. Libraries, websites, um, people, like mentors and stuff like that was awesome. Because most people, they are able to tell you something, but they're not able to back it up. And she was able to back it up. Yeah. They're both, they both were both incredible.